So we try to show what uh, uh, mild, moderate, and definite population would look like. So the percentages you can see for homozygous, heterozygous, and compound heterozygous that you can see for severe cases, we had more homozygous. But heterozygous, we had only five patients which were severe. Heterozygous have one healthy gene. They are not supposed to get severe cases. So what we did, we sequenced them. We found a second mutation which in Armenia they can't find because they don't sequence it. Now we found that, but only in one patient. The other four we couldn't sequence because the sample was old. We tried to contact the people that came from rural areas, never responded, never came back to us. So all our basis was on that one sample saying that five out of uh, sequenced people, uh, one out of five had that second mutation. So we're assuming that about 20 to 25 percent of the population of heterozygotes are uh, false negatives. That means they have two mutations, but in Armenia we cannot really see it. Now, uh, what about the rest? How about the 75% of the rest, or 70% of the rest? What happens to them? Then we look at that uh, area here, and we can see that they're pretty much here on the mild side of the area with the severity score. Next slide. Uh, so here is where we calculate the severity scores. Next. Next. Here it is. So, Heterozygous, the blue ones, you can see they are on the score of 7 or 8 and lower. So they are mild to moderate. Homozygous, on the other hand, they start low on the mild to moderate and they become very severe here. So the next slide. Here is where we did a binomial probability distribution. So we can be fancy statistically to show that uh, uh, what we did. This is a cluster gram, and for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, MATLAB, we use MATLAB program to do this. And cluster gram shows the yellow lines are the absent, uh, the presence, and the green lines are the absence. So here, this line, from here down, where we heterozygous and up homozygous. So you can see they are very, very similar, except fever and abdominal pain were a little different, but fever and abdominal pain are pretty much symptoms of everything. So it's not significant to go based on those. But the rest of them, and those are the probabilities that we got from the formula, they're all high probabilities. So we show that heterozygous individuals for three mutations have mild to moderate FMF, and they have to be true. And that's what uh, it was, it went to the journal, they read it, they loved it, they published it uh, in, in a month or so. So, the next slide, which they asked, obviously, one of the uh, readers, because there were three people who reviewed it, one of them was definitely Jewish, because he was asking, what about E148Q? What about that? Because that's in the Jewish population. So I said, I'll be generous, I'll put any information I have for you so you can see. So we put everything here in this table, and we sent to the journal, and they loved it, and they uh, put this, and this showing that what our population has. Basically, it's the gold mine information of the Armenian population for the science, uh, scientific community of the world. Next slide. So, uh, conclusion. We got, what we brought in, which no one had brought in, was the concept of haploinsufficiency. This is a genetic term that means one mutation, one healthy allele, one mutated allele in heterozygous individuals is overwhelmed with inflammation in this case, so the healthy one cannot produce enough protein to fight the inflammation. It is producing it, like type 2 diabetes. If you overwhelm the body with sugar, it, insulin is produced, but it's not enough, so you get diabetes. Now here is the same concept, uh, which was new for this FMF, and we brought it in, is that if one healthy allele is not enough to fight the inflammation. Therefore, it is causing the symptoms, but since it's there, it's causing mild to moderate, not severe symptoms. Now, again, as, as I mentioned, we don't, well, obviously, easing the pain is great, but we are thinking about amyloid tissue buildup, not the pain, as scientists or physicians. Now, uh, that's where the colchicine therapy has to immediately start for these individuals, and uh, to the dosage, now which I have a slide on the dosage, which I'll talk about it next. And then we did uh, 
That's our symptom. And the cases that are uh, impossible to know, I had a case uh, from an uh, Iranian-born Armenian parent, lived in Europe, young, at age 20, all of a sudden start showing the symptoms, fully sequenced the gene in Europe, has one mutation, A744S, completely not one of those severe <coughs> mutations, has very severe disease. Now what happened is that he started at age 20, very brilliant, bright guy. He started wor working in London's stock exchange. So all of a sudden he went from a very comfortable college life to very stressful, hard environment to make the money. And that's when the symptoms started. And right now, colchicine doesn't work on him. That's the problem. There are 1-2% to of individuals which colchicine doesn't help him. So what do they do? First, we have to find what is contributing to the FMF symptoms. This is our theory, and uh, I e emailed with Professor Hawkins in, in London College of Medicine, which is the biggest guru in England on FMF, and he agreed that we have to find what is... There is another condition which is contributing in this individual, which even we give the colchicine, but that it's not the drug for the other condition, which, is, which has FMF like symptoms. So that's the problem that they're facing for that minority of 1-2%, to which uh, one is just too many for every family and we know that. So that's a reality that we are seeing. Next slide. Uh, let's move on quickly through these slides. I'm not going to go through this for the sake of time. Let's move on. And here is the, just showing that patients come. I had here patients and they came, they were talking, okay, my grandmother didn't have it, we don't have it in our family, why is my child having it? Well, we tried to explain, then I came up with this diagram, I draw it, and I said, look, if your, gra if your grandmother, grandfather, and your husband's side, grandmother, grandfather, were carriers, which did not show the symptom, they could transfer it to your parents, or a bunch of offsprings, uh, brothers, sisters, siblings, and eventually, two people who are carriers are going to produce an affected person. It's not going to go away. It's going to stay in the population until it shows itself. And it's by chance. It depends on which sperm got into which egg. That's it. That's how simple it is. So it is by chance and, uh, I mean, the lucky ones get it and luckier ones don't. So that's the concept of it. Next slide. Next. So here is what we are working on. Now what I'm doing, I'm trying to look at the other primates who have FMF in their body, who have the gene in their body, and try to see if the changes that we see in the mutations are in chimps, macaques, and marmots. Those are the primates who are very close to the humans. So we're trying, I'm trying to see if they are there, and in order they're changed, and what they're changed. So we can actually identify which mutation is actually causing the severe case and which one is not, because if it's in the other, well, unless the chimp or the marmots that they sequenced actually had FMF, but we didn't know. That's bad luck. But that's, we're assuming that they are healthy. So we're looking at that right now to be able to find the mutation function. Next slide. <coughs> 